Chaldeón, Onguetorri, uh, vamos a. Buenas tardes. Vamos a comenzar con eh, otra de las uh, Brain Talks que, bueno, pues estamos haciendo para la ciudadanía cada vez que organizamos pues, un evento científico importante. Y de nuevo, pues nos encontramos aquí en el acuario gracias a la a la generosidad del, de, de, del equipo que lleva el acuario y de su presidente, que nos va pues, a, a dar unas palabras de bienvenida y a continuación pues, daremos eh, paso al profesor Gary Lupián, que nos hablará pues, a, de algo tan fascinante que les adelantaré dentro de unos minutos. Entonces, por favor, a don Vicente Zaragüeta. Bueno, Arrachaldeón, me encanta ver aquí a tanta juventud, eso me encanta, a pesar que los viejos también tenemos mérito de, de colaborar con todos vosotros. Bueno, Arrachaldeón, buenas tardes, no le veo a, a, mis, a mi buen amigo Gary Lupian, ¿no? Lupian, ¿dónde está? Ah. Bueno, y luego también a, a, a mi amigo Powell, que no le veo dónde está, pero sé que está aquí. Y le, echo, y le echamos muy en falta a Ana Fernández, que es una, una, una mujer extraordinaria y muy amiga de esta casa y mío. Bueno, antes que nada, quiero daros la bienvenida a este Aquarium de Donostia, un lugar que siempre ha acogido a todas las iniciativas orientadas al progreso y a la innovación. El Aquarium de Donostia, San Sebastián, y los que en él trabajamos, recibimos con satisfacción a cuantos trabajan por facilitar los vínculos de unión a las personas y a los pueblos. Es un honor para nosotros que nos hayáis elegido como sede para profundizar en vuestro esfuerzo por estudiar las circunstancias que diversificaron tanto la expresión lingüística de la humanidad, las raíces de los distintos y complicados idiomas que se separan, que se, que se sepan a unos pueblos de otros. Ojalá el imparable proceso de evolución de la informática pueda llegar a algún modo de unificación de las lenguas para aumentar los lazos de unión entre quienes todavía las entienden como elemento separador y diferenciador. Las lenguas, cualquiera que sean las lenguas, son un patrimonio de la especie humana y por el hecho de existir ya enriquecen el espíritu y capacitan a la humanidad para comunicarse. Deseo fervientemente que vuestro trabajo sirga, sirva para hacer de esa comunicación un vínculo de unión para que las palabras sean algo más que pura voz y transmitan sentimientos solidarios. En este fondo del mar en miniatura, que creo que, no sé si lo habéis visto hace, hace un momento, pero en fin, el acuario es el fondo del mar en miniatura, los peces no hablan, casi ni siquiera emiten sonidos perceptibles, pero les basta con sus miradas, sus movimientos y sus señales corporales para, para comunicarse con su entorno, para respetar y hacerse respetar sus espacios. El suyo es un lenguaje universal que saben interpretar entre ellos sin confusiones ni dobleces, ni, dobleces en, eh, eh, senti ni, ni, ni dobles sentidos. En eso nos ganan. Y nada más, mis queridos amigos, que deseamos que sea un trabajo provechoso y una feliz estancia en esta casa. Es que Ricasco, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias Vicente. Bueno, pues uh, muchas gracias por venir acá. Uh, a pesar de que es un día, parece que bastante festivo y mucha gente pues está haciendo... Otras, eh, otras cosas. Hoy tenemos con nosotros al profesor eh, Gary Lupian de la Universidad de Wisconsin-Madison en Estados Unidos. Uh, 
Uh, él realizó sus estudios en la Universidad de Cornell, luego pues, uh, fue a hacer la tesis doctoral con eh, otro eminente científico, con eh, Jay McClellan, que es de un miembro de nuestro uh, comité uh, asesor, y uh, hizo luego una estancia postdoctoral en la Universidad de Pensilvania con Sharon Tonshonshill, y ahora pues, está de profesor en la Universidad de Wisconsin-Madison. Y bueno, pues eh, además de toda la investigación puntera que está haciendo, pues uh, uh, tiene otra serie de uh, inquietudes y una de ellas es uh, la, eh, el conocer un poquito más la diversidad de lenguas y por qué existen esas lenguas y entonces hoy nos va a contar un poco pues uh, sus uh, experiencias y sus uh, investigaciones sobre este pormenor. Sin más dilación, uh, thank you for coming and uh, it's your turn. Now, uh, hay uh, traductores simultáneos para aquellos que, que lo necesiten. Ok, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. Um, if uh, uh, I'd like to leave as much time for questions as possible. So, uh, as I'm speaking, uh, if you have a question, uh, if, it's, if, it, if you really need to ask, please raise your hand, and I'm happy to pause and take the question. And uh, if not, then please remember what you were going to ask, and uh, there'll be time at the end, and I'm happy to have a discussion going. There should be enough time for that. Uh, the, the story I will try to tell is uh, based on some work I've been doing with my friend and collaborator, Rick Dale, who's sitting right there. And uh, what we set out to do is to try to answer a question that linguists have been uh, puzzled over for a long time, and uh, that people in general have been interested in for an even longer time. Uh, why are there so many languages? And why are some uh, at least seemingly so complicated, and others at least seemingly uh, so uh, relatively simple. Uh, one reason why people may have become interested, even in uh, biblical times, uh, about this question is that looking around, they might have seen that different people looked quite similar to one another, uh, but they spoke languages that seemed to sound completely different and to be incomprehensible to people. So. Um, you know, people living in one village might speak a language that is quite different from people living in the village next door. And so, of course, we all know that languages sound differently. This is just a sense of uh, how many languages there are in the world, between six and 7,000. Uh, and so here are some examples of, of languages, so you can hear um, how differently some of them sound. So this is... Um, Ugyanezen a napon, amikor este lett, így szólt hozzájuk. Menjünk át a túlsó partra. Okay. Miután tehát elbocsátották a sokaságot, magukkal vitték őt úgy, ahogy éppen a hajóban volt. So some De of you here might nyomában. recognize this as, uh, nagy as being Hungarian. Here's another language, sounds quite different. Uh, this is a language that was used by the United States during World War II, um, by uh, people speaking in code. So this is uh, Navajo. And uh, here's uh, something that's even, even uh, at least by sound, even more different. Uh, so this is a language spoken in South Africa, spoken by many people, about 8 million people. Uh, and what's different about this language is that uh, it uses click sounds uh, that to Western ears sound very strange, but um, that are used in many languages. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first thing I will try to convince you of is that the differences between languages go beyond just these kinds of differences in how they sound, but go all the way down. Uh, and, uh, and then I will try to answer this question of why might there be so many languages, and 
uh, why are some so complicated? Um, so if we look at different languages, so these are just uh, some languages spoken in Europe, in the European languages, uh, we can represent them in terms of these kinds of trees. And the farther back in time you go, so in the left, uh, the farther back, uh, the more similar the languages become. Um, you might notice that Basque is not on here, and that is because it's, of course, not an Indo-European language. It's thought to be the last remaining <laughs> pre-Indo-European language spoken in Western Europe. So it's, it's quite special in that regard. Now, the normal answer to the question of why do these languages diversify? Why they, do they become different? How do we go from Latin to all the Romance languages, to Spanish, French, Italian, is that um, at one time there is one community of people all communicating with each other. Um, so, and then the groups spread apart. So Sapir says uh, dialects arise, and then later languages arise, because two or more groups of individuals have become sufficiently disconnected to drift apart or independently instead of together. And uh, he goes on to say, of course, it's impossible to have a language community that is spread over an area that is too vast. So the reason Latin uh, diversifies is that it becomes spoken over too wide an area. And some communities are no longer speaking to other communities very much, and the language starts uh, to diversify and to change. And so that kind of explanation uh, is a non-functional explanation in that there is no particular reason why languages change in the way this that they do. Uh, it simply has to do with um, where people live and the size of the community. The answer, the, the question why uh, are languages different, uh, we can think about this question in terms of uh, animals and biological organisms. Uh, why are there different animals? And the answer there has been that, uh, that, that animals adapt to their environments, right? And so the reason that um, these birds have these different beak shapes is not simply that they once all had the same beak, but then they moved apart and the beaks just happened to start all looking different. It's that they specialize in different kinds of diets, some are aquatic birds, some are land birds, and the beak, the shape of the beak adapts to the environment uh, the bird finds itself in. And so the suggestion is that languages are like animals, in that they both adapt to their environments. And so when we're talking about uh, biological organisms, we can specify quite precisely what environment they um, are specializing in. So these are uh, Galapagos finches, uh, the, the birds that uh, Darwin uh, first described in The Origin of the Species and studied. Um, and we now know quite, quite a lot about how uh, differences, even very seemingly small differences, like what part of the tree uh, a given uh, bird species or subspecies inhabits, how that uh, interacts with its physiology and how uh, the birds adapt to specialize in a particular environment. Um, I just wanted to show you something just about how, how you know, diversity of life, so here's another way of looking at uh, all of life, not a tree in this case, but a circle, and uh, those are humans over there. Okay. Now, when we look at animals, there was never much debate that animals are different from one another. Uh, everyone can see that. And uh, everyone can also, of course, hear that languages are sound differently from one another. Uh, but in the field of linguistics, there has been a dogma for a long time that these differences are really superficial. Um, it's a little like saying, well, sure, these fish, there's a large aquarium behind the screen. Uh, with it looks something like this. Uh, surely these fish all look different, but 
really, they're, they're all fish, so they're just, they're not different in any interesting way. Um, and so this kind of thinking for a long time now has been applied to languages. And so the first thing, as I mentioned, that I hope to convince you of is that this is actually not true. Um, now, to tell the full story would take a long time, so let me just go through a few examples of uh, just how difficult it is to find even one feature that all languages share. So for example, one might want to claim that all languages have verb and noun affixes. For example, um, in English, you combine the verb walk with the suffix ed to turn it into the past walked. Or uh, in Spanish, we can make a noun plural, so add an s, go from gato to gatos. But not all languages do this. Plenty of languages don't use any sorts of prefixes or suffixes. There has been a claim that all languages have uh, what's called syntactic recursion. So the ability to say things like the mouse that was chased by the cat was really fast. Uh, but in fact, we now know there are exceptions. And so even in English and Spanish, we can express this without using this kind of re uh, recursion. We can say, uh, the mouse, it was chased by a cat. That mouse was fast. Right? And some languages do exactly this. Uh, even the claim that all languages have nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, these classical categories, uh, also turns out to not really hold. Um, so, uh, in, a, in a short story, uh, Jorge Luis uh, Borges has, um, so I, I included the Spanish translation there, um, imagines this alien language that doesn't have nouns and verbs where everything is really, there's only one type of word. And I'll pause here so you can just read it. And so it turns out that there are, in fact, human languages that work like this. So this is a language um, that used to be fairly widespread in the Pacific Northwest, a North American indigenous language, um, Strait Salish. Uh, right now, uh, the last, at, at the last count, which is 10 years ago, there were 20 remaining speakers. And uh, in this language, there is no simple noun-verb distinction. Um, so whether we're talking about events or entities or even proper names, uh, the, the type of word is the same, but it just fits into a somewhat different slot. And so even here, something seemingly universal that m all uh, Indo-European languages, for example, have uh, is not true of all human languages. Um, even the claim that all languages have vowels and consonants, surely the building blocks of languages, also turns out to not be true. The clear exception is, of course, sign languages, which are full languages. They're languages just like spoken languages, but they don't have nouns and consonants. But even in the vocal domain, uh, there are uh, ways to communicate linguistically without using vowels and consonants. So this is actually a form of Spanish spoken on um, or whistled on the Canary Islands, Silbo Gomero. Uh, okay, and so what's happened here is over the centuries, um, the population to communicate over these long distances have uh, adapted Spanish into this whistling language where there are types of whistles that correspond, each whistle corresponds to several uh, sounds in Spanish. And um, 
I'll talk a bit more about it uh, in a little bit. Uh, but here's um, a language that's, that's perfectly usable by people that has no really vowels and consonants. Okay, so, so this, this idea is, is not quite right. Languages really are different, and we can next ask the question of why, why are they so different, and why are some so complicated? And so the answer, the simple answer to why are there so many languages, the cl our claim is that it's the same as the answer to the question of why are there so many animals. And the reason is that there are lots of different environments, and there are lots of different ways for an animal to survive, and the form and, and the brain of the animal adapts to those different niches or environments. And we can see if that's also true of languages. And we're going to do this by seeing if languages spoken in particular environments have in some way adapted to those environments. Now, just how different in complexity are some languages? Well, consider the following example. Um, in this example, um, we're going to talk about uh, terms that are called uh, deictics. So these are terms like this, that, here, there. Uh, both English and Spanish have relatively very simple systems. Uh, but that's not true of all languages. So here's a language in which um, one needs to specify, as in English or Spanish, the field of the speaker. So are you talking about something here or something there? Uh, but there are many, many more distinctions. So you would use different forms of the word, um, whether you're talking about inside space or outside space, whether the this that you're talking about is up or down, um, whether it's close to the speaker or close to the listener. Um, and there are also multiple cases and genders and so on. And so what you end up with are these very complex expressions that uh, very precisely specify where something is without actually naming many objects. So the only um, noun here is kayak uh, and, and just thing. Uh, but this term specifies quite precisely where that thing is with respect to the kayak. Okay, so if we count the words, uh, English has four ways, four distinctions, um, whereas the language that we're concerned with here has 88 ways. Now, they're not arbitrary in a particular situation. There are probably only a few different ways of expressing it, but you can see that there is an obvious difference in the level of complexity. Here's a much more mild example. Um, Old English that eventually became modern English, so spoken about a thousand years ago, um, used to have these words that specify, uh, they're just different forms of the word where, and you would use one to talk about a location, and one a uh, different one to use uh, direction. Okay? German still has this. English no longer has it. Right? And so we can ask why. What is it about the, the environment in which English is spoken that was different from the environment in which German was spoken that may have produced this kind of difference? One more general way of talking about uh, complexity, and this is a certain kind of complexity in the language, is to talk about how complicated are the verbs, conjugating verbs. So in English, uh, it's quite simple. There are really only two things you can do to a verb. You can make it uh, into, uh, turn it into a past tense, or you can conjugate it for uh, agreement. So, I go, he goes. Um, Spanish is, of course, a bit more complicated, uh, but not nearly as complicated as some languages. So, this is Georgian. And uh, if you were to try to compile uh, lists of a particular form of the, the word, uh, this is, these are just some of them, right? 
So compared to, uh, say, Latin, this is much, much more elaborate. Um, okay. And uh, in addition to all of these different ways of uh, changing the, um, the word to agree with the speaker and so on, um, there are also th th there's this class of uh, prefixes that change the, change the meaning of the verb quite radically. So the root, the infinitive is this QR, uh, but if you prefix it with da, it means one thing. If you prefix it with she, it means something different, and so on. Um, okay. So this is a, a very different way of doing it than, say, English or Spanish. Um, l many linguists have found it useful to talk about a kind of continuum between analytic or isolating languages on one side and polysynthetic languages on the other. Okay, and this is only one way of cutting the space, but it's, it's one that's quite useful. And so on the left side um, are many of the languages that we're familiar with. On the right side are languages like the Inuit language that I mentioned with the different ways of saying this and that. Uh, and here's, here's another example, uh, another Native American language um, that used to be spoken in upstate New York, Cayuga, um, in which whole sentences become embedded into a single word. Okay, so this is quite common for languages that are uh, on this right side. Okay. So now we're ready to ask the specific question of whether these differences are in some way related to the environment in which the languages are spoken. Just like we can understand something about why the beaks of these birds look the way they do based on studying the environments in which the birds live, maybe we can understand why languages differ in the ways that they do by looking at the environments in which they're spoken. And so that's a very big question, and so what I'll show you are just the initial, uh, the initial studies we've done to uh, start understanding it. Um, one thing that will be useful in answering this question is trying to understand what does it mean to talk about an environment in which a language is spoken. So we can look at a particular bird or fish and see, okay, does it live in salt water or fresh water? Uh, does the bird uh, eat nuts or fruits? Uh, so what, are, uh, what sorts of factors are important uh, when we look at linguistic environments? One factor we looked at is population. How many people speak a language? So this is something that uh, there are languages spoken by very few people, there are languages spoken by many people. Uh, people are surprised to learn that half of the world's languages are only spoken uh, by fewer than 7,000 people. So, okay. so there are about between six and 7,000 languages in the world. Half of them have fewer than 7,000 speakers. Okay. So in comparison, Basque is spoken by about 600,000. So that's not very many, but much more than, than 7,000. And half of the world's languages are spoken over an area of about 950 square kilometers. That's about the size of, of Luxembourg. Okay. Uh, so when we think about a language like Spanish or English or Mandarin Chinese, this is not the norm. Uh, the norm is something like this. So this is a, a bit of uh, Papua New Guinea, one of the most linguistically diverse environments in the world. And these are, um, based on the data we, we, um, we got, the language boundaries. And so you can see just how linguistically diverse this area is. Now the languages that neighbor each other tend, n tend to be quite related. They're not completely different. but um, it doesn't take much to go from you know, one area to another to end up in a, in a place where the language is, is radically different. Okay, and so to test this idea that languages adapt to uh, what we call the cultural ecology or the linguistic niche, um, we found it useful to think about how is 
how are languages spoken by few people versus many people um, learned and used? Okay. And so all languages have to be learnable. Right? We can't have an unlearnable language because it just wouldn't be passed on to the next generation. Uh, all languages have to be learnable by infants. Right? There are exceptions. There are uh, made-up languages. So, for instance, uh, there is Klingon in Star Trek. There is Esperanto. And interestingly, um, been s there's been some work showing what happens when uh, infants learn Esperanto. Uh, but normally, all languages are learned by infants. So there's, a, there's the usual language learner. But only some languages are learned by adults. Okay. So there is a very strong constraint on languages to be to have forms that are learnable by, by these guys, but only some languages have ever been learned by adults. Right? Um, we can look at some numbers. So here are <coughs> population sizes of a few languages, uh, looking at the number of native speakers and non-native speakers. Okay. So Abkhaz has about 110,000, and about 95% of those are native speakers. Japanese is an interesting case because it has many, many speakers, um, something like 120 million. I think it's, that's probably too high. Um, but about 99% are native speakers. And for languages like uh, Yupik Eskimo, uh, there are very, very few speakers, and um, the only non-native speaker might be uh, one or two linguists who uh, try to learn the language to write its grammar. Uh, the story is very different for other languages, so English, Malay, Swahili. Um, English has about, it, it's hard to estimate these numbers, but about 400 million native speakers, and depending on how you count, many more non-native speakers. And in all about the estimates that I've seen are that about 70% of speakers of English are not native speakers. Uh, and that's not the most extreme. So Swahili, um, in Swahili only about 10% are native speakers uh, because it's used much more widely as a kind of a lingua franca and it, there's a core group uh, only that use it as their really primary native language. Okay, so many languages look like this, and some languages look like this. So th these are, in red, are countries in which English is a dominant language. Um, so we can ask, does it, does it matter? Uh, is it the case that languages that are learned by many people have grammars that, over time, have become different? Okay, now there are lots of examples of um, people having trouble with, with English just because so many are, are learning it. So, uh, and, and, and here's, uh, here's another example in China. Okay. Um, but the reason you get this is that uh, there are so many people learning English. That's not the case for most of the world's languages. Okay, and so we can ask whether, first question is whether there is some relationship between this kind of difference in grammar and the difference, and uh, we're calling it here, I'm using these words, exoteric and esoteric. Uh, so languages on the right tend to have fewer speakers they're spoken over smaller areas, and there's generally more social cohesion. So think about this factor in the following way. If all you know is that someone speaks English, you really can't tell very much about them. They could be from anywhere in the world. Um, 
there's really, because all kinds of people speak English, uh, if you know that someone speaks Basque, there is much more you can tell. Um, and so, on this end, we have cases of uh, people speaking more or less the same language over very diverse environments. And there is not much you can know about them just from knowing what language they speak. Okay, and so the question we asked, the hypothesis we put forward, is whether there is this relationship between social structure, who learns the language, who uses the language, and grammatical structure. And we predicted that languages with more speakers and those that are used by more diverse communities um, have adapted to this niche. In, um, they adapted in a cultural way just as birds adapt uh, in biologically through natural selection uh, to their physical environments, so languages adapt culturally to their social environments. And to test this hypothesis, we used um, a resource that became available relatively recently called uh, WALS, the World Atlas of Language Structures, which combines information from uh, hundreds and hundreds of historic linguists, of descriptive linguists, over thousands of languages, um, pulls the information together and allows us to run quantitative analyses on these data. And so the first question we asked whether was whether this variable that um, I mentioned earlier of verb morphology um, correlates with features like population and the size over which a language is spoken. So in this, uh, uh, in this variable, English would get a score of two, Georgian would get a score of nine. Okay, and Spanish is about four. Okay. Um, and so he here's the data from walls, and you can see that geographically there are differences. So languages in Europe, for example, tend to, uh, these white marks correspond to um, more simple verb morphology, and um, if we do the analyses, we get a very strong relationship. So those are just some sample languages that are in these categories. Uh, there were many more languages included. And we see that languages that have more complex verbs tend to be spoken by fewer people, or conversely, languages that are spoken by many, many people over wide areas tend to be, in this respect, simpler. Uh, we've analyzed this in a number of ways. We can, instead of individual languages, also look at language families, and we get similar relationships. So groups of languages, so now all Indo-European languages are just collapsed into a single point. Um, and as part of this work, we looked at uh, other aspects of languages, for example, possession, evidentiality, tense, and I'll give you just a flavor of, of some of these analyses uh, because they also point out just in interesting ways in which uh, languages differ. So possession um, refers to sentences like the girl's ice cream. So it's what does a language do to signal that the ice cream belongs to the girl? So English does this apostrophe s, or you can also say um, uh, the ice cream of the girl, but this is the normal way of saying it. Uh, but there are other types of possession, right? Say my brother, my hand. Um, you can refer to the country's population, right? Things like that. And some languages distinguish these kinds of types of possession. So um, they, they do different grammatical uh, things to mark them. So here's one example. Um, a distinction that a number of languages make is between alienable and inalienable possession. Uh, so if you say my milk in English, it's ambiguous. Do you mean my milk, the milk that I bought, or my breast milk? 
right? So something that's part of your body. Uh, you can specify this, of course, in, in, in English if you need to, but other languages force the speaker to make this distinction. It cannot be left unsaid. And so when we look to see um, whether this is related to factors like population, we find that in, indeed it is, such that uh, languages spoken by more people tend to have simpler ways of expressing possession. This doesn't mean there's no way to talk about it, of course. You can disambiguate, you can specify, but it's not part of the grammar. Um, we can look at the future tense, so that's quite simple. Um, how do you express that something will happen in the future? Some languages do it using the grammar, other languages do it using separate words. So uh, I can say, you know, tomorrow I go, right? Um, so you can use some, some word to signal that it's going to happen in the future. Um, other languages do it in the grammar, and again we see a difference, so that languages that use a grammatical way of expressing it, where it's really built into the language, tend to have fewer speakers. Languages that have more speakers uh, do it, uh, either omit it entirely, or you have to use separate words. So the final example is evidentiality. And uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, this refers to uh, ways of signaling how you've come to know something. So instead of saying, um, I know that the earth is round, you, would, you have to specify how you've come to know this. Is this something that you were told? Is this something that you figured out yourself? Is it something that's just common sense? Did you see it yourself? And so different languages have uh, very specific ways of marking this. Um, whether, for instance, if you say the, mo the motor roared, right? Is it something you heard yourself? Or is it something that you were told? Um, and um, there are also these kinds of evidentials. And there's something interesting happening with English right now where uh, it's quite cumbersome <coughs> to say, my friend told me this, or my friend said this, and then my other friend said this. And so in English, people are starting to use like as, as this kind of marker, so they say, Instead of my friend said, they say my friend was like, and then they say a quote. And so like is being used as, a, as what's called a quotative, but some languages really use it in a grammatical way. Okay, and again we see this difference. Languages that um, build it into the grammar tend to be the smaller languages. If we put it all together, put all of these factors, combine them into kind of one score, um, we get this relationship so that the more people there are speaking a language, the simpler it becomes. Okay. Now, we can ask the question of why is there so much complexity to begin with? So, the story about why languages get simpler is that there are certain things that adults find difficult to learn, and they have an impact over time on the language, and the things that are difficult for adults to learn drop out. If a language is never learned by adults, it keeps those things, but why are they there in the first place? So why don't we all um, speak languages like English or Mandarin or Lao that are quite uh, simple in terms of their uh, morphology, parts of the grammar? Um, and one answer we've s just started to explore is that maybe this complexity actually helps children to learn the language. And so the idea here is that the, these languages that have more complexity, uh, it's complex for adults, but it actually may help children because it increases uh, redundancy. And so here's an example from another um, language in the Pacific Northwest that takes uh, grammatical gender to a new level. So we have a sentence, this is, this is the sentence, the woman put a lot of sand on the large table. Uh, the grammatical gender is expressed on every, on every word and 
uh, multiple times. So for instance, in this one sentence, uh, that table is masculine is repeated three times. And the idea is that for, for these guys, this is just complicated and unnecessary. But for infants learning the language, it may help to ground the language in the environment. Um, and to see whether this is actually true, whether, first of all, languages, for instance, spoken by more people, are somehow more ambiguous, less, um, less, less determined, um, we took a document that's been translated into um, over 100 languages and just looked to see are the translations in some languages um, more redundant? Do they contain multiple information kind of marked multiple times? And so one very simple and it turns out powerful way of looking at this is to take th this text, Declaration of Human Rights, uh, in we have it over 100 languages and then use just uh, program to zip the file. So you've probably all done this on your computers. Um, just zip the file, okay? And what zipping does is it takes out much of the redundancy, just that's in, in the words of the language. So if you have a case marker or a gender marker marked in all these words, then you only need to represent it once and then you just take out all the rest. And so it turned out that indeed languages spoken again, by more people, were uh, less redundant. Uh, and this may be a good thing, again, for adults, but it may make it more difficult to initially learn by kids. Uh, and so this is an empirical prediction. We need to actually test whether this is true, whether kids um, find certain aspects of languages like English uh, particularly difficult to learn. So in becoming more easily learnable by adults, English may have uh, become somewhat more difficult or require special training um, uh, to be learned to a proficient degree by kids. So this is something we're looking at now. Okay, uh, the last thing I'll talk about just for a few minutes is another aspect of the language environment, and that's actually the physical environment. And so we return to the Canary Islands. And um to announce celebrations and funerals, Romarias or pilgrimages, weddings and baptisms. It is not a language created for the intimate. It is for the public, for what must be said out loud and can be heard by all. Okay, so as you can see, it's not a coincidence that this kind of whistling form of, of language arose in this environment. It arose for a specific purpose, and it arose because the, um, the Canary Islands have an environment like this with valleys, and because of the kind of agriculture being, that was being practiced, People had to communicate over long distances. Um, that's not true of environments like this. So this is this, the city where I live now, Madison. Uh, there are no valleys. You don't need to sc scream over the hills so that someone can hear you. Uh, you know, we, we people talk on phones. It's uh, so we can ask the question of whether the physical environment bears some relationship onto the language. And so here's another kind of environment. And we can imagine what might be necessary to communicate where something is. Um, so to say that, you know, can you run over to that rock? Well, you know, there might be lots of rocks scattered around. How would, you know, how would you know which one? And so as it happens, languages that have these kinds of systems tend to be spoken in places like this. And languages that um, are spoken 
in places like this, where there are lots of objects, there are streets and houses, and you can say things like, it's across the street, right? Or it's next to the house, right? Um, whereas you can't do that here. And so there hasn't been much research done on this, but it's an interesting avenue of future research. Um, whether the natural, the degree to which in the, the environment has been shaped by people interacts in interesting ways with, um, with the grammar of the language. One, one final interesting, perhaps, example. Uh, an area where there has been more research is in uh, systems, um, also to indicate where something is, but on a, on a larger scale. Uh, and these systems are, of course, used for navigation. So we can say things like, turn right, or we can say, turn north, okay? Um, and it turns out that they, too, interact in an interesting way with the environment in which a language is spoken. Now, when we turn to other animals, we find remarkable systems of navigation. So this is a homing pigeon, and when it was uh, taken and had a, a hood placed over its head and transported 66 kilometers uh, without seeing where it's going and then just let loose, um, they all find their way home, but they, not only that, but they initially tend to fly in the direction that's um, in the direction of home. So they have these built-in systems for navigation, for sensing the Earth's magnetic fields. How do people do? Well, so these data I I'm about to show you is from a group of British hikers who were led, who walked one kilometer on a trail in the forest and then told, okay, which way is back where you started? Which way is home? And so. That's their data. Okay. Um, here's what happens when you disorient someone. Not everyone. Spin in more. Most people would <laughs> hopefully do better. Calm down! Don't run! I'm backing up! Back it up, back it up, back it up! Okay. Um, now it turns out that there are people who are quite good at these kinds of tasks. So here is a group of Australian Aborigines in the in the desert in Australia, pointing to di various distances, um, some of which were 300 kilometers away. So pointing to where, in the direction of a city, pointing to in the direction of a water well, and so on. Okay. Here's uh, another group. Okay, I, this is um, a group of um, um, African bushmen. Okay. Um, so distances hundreds of kilometers away, and just for comparison, here's a British sample. Okay, it turns out that, um, of course, the environment that the people that these people live in is quite different, but their language is different as well. So in most of the languages we're familiar with, if you wanted to say where the fork is. A fork is to the left of the plate. Um, but there are quite a few languages, by some estimations about a third of the world's languages, where you would not use terms like left and right, which are based on your body. But instead you would use a term like uphill, downhill, or north, south, that is based on the external environment. Um, and if we look to see where these kinds of languages are spoken, so the one that was studied perhaps the most is uh, Tinehapan Mayan. And um, this language is spoken in a particular area, and um, it, most of the land is on a slant. And people use this not just to talk about where things are outside, but also for things inside their homes. So they would s say that the fork is uphill of the plate. Um, 
here's another kind of system. Um, and in addition, often these systems have complex terms for different parts of the environment. Now, this kind of system is not uh, useful in an environment like this. Okay? But it is quite useful in an environment like this, right? So in, a, in the Himalayas, many of the languages spoken make reference to the mountains just because they are ever-present. They're always there. And even though they may not be seen inside the home, uh, people always know where they are. And so the idea is that this provides a kind of training where using this language makes everyone into a good navigator. We don't need these languages to become good navigators. If you're learning to uh, fly planes or sail or um, navigate through forests, you can become quite good and you end up actually using a system like this. Uh, but in a language like this, everyone, just to say where the fork is, has to become, in a fact, uh, a, an, an expert navigator. So this is just a story about, um, a lot of this work was done by Steve Levinson um, at the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen. And uh, this is from um, a book where they tell a story about trying to disorient someone, uh, a Mayan in, uh, in Mexico. Okay, and so that's quite different from the guy trying to hit the piñata. Okay. So, to, to conclude, we've shown some, some data that the grammar of languages is related, is not just randomly varying, but related to the social and environmental factors in which the language is spoken. Um, these environments are changing. So here's an interesting um, fact. The idea is that particular languages may help us cope with specific environments. Um, there are 300 million people reportedly learning English in China. Uh, that's about the population of the US. And so we can ask how such an influx of uh, non-native speakers might in time change the language. English is a, is a very unique language in that throughout its history, even before uh, the British Empire, even before, it was used by a, a very diverse group of people uh, because of the various invaders coming to the British Isles. Uh, that's not the case for most of the world's languages. Uh, and so we are constantly running these kinds of natural experiments. So here is an interesting animation of the change in the Iberian Peninsula of languages over time. Uh, right. And so historical linguists have data on how these languages changed over the time, but we can now start looking to see how these changes may be related to these kinds of transitions where um, Castilian at one point spoken by relatively few people, then it expands and it's now you know, spoken by a more diverse group of people. Um, Basque contracts and is spoken by a more cohesive perhaps but smaller group of people. And um, if language helps us cope with our environment, helps us to learn about things like navigating, we can see how that interacts with um, the, the change in who speaks the language. Uh, so I'll, I'll close with this, with this quote by uh, John Hayes, who says that the use of language cannot change reality, but it can change the perception of reality. Uh, parents bringing up offspring can use language to mold the cognitive structure of children in ways that promote uh, survival. Uh, and this process becomes one of structuring perception by using the acquisition of vocabulary and grammar to modify perceptual categorization. Um, in most of the work I do, I actually look at how language structures cognitive and perceptual systems, and it seems from, from some of these experiments that the effects are quite deep. Language can literally change how we, how we see. Um, and then the question is, how might different languages change this as well? How do they make us the people uh, that we are? Thank you.
Thank you very much for, <coughs> for the exciting uh, talk. Uh, bueno, ahora tenemos uh, uh, un tiempo para preguntas. Si alguien quiere preguntar algo sobre esta charla tan provocativa. Sí, ahora un micrófono. Uh, are you going to get the... Okay. Yeah? Pues, <coughs> yeah. uh, should I speak to him in English or in Spanish? Or? Oh. Either way, I don't know whether they, they uh, si habla en inglés eh, la traductora lo oye o no, sí, venga, con lo que quiera. No, simply to say that it was provocative indeed, and there are seven or eight or ten different subjects that could be mentioned, but one of them, and to start with, uh, would be uh, why people tend to talk so much about the differences in language in languages, um, and so little about the similarities uh, in the different languages, because they are, no matter how different they can be, what um, Chomsky said about the Martian scientist who thinks we only speak one language on Earth, you have erased it as non-valid, but I think it is very valid. And we, we are really, uh, in no matter what language, we are only talking about people, me, you, them. Uh, we are talking about uh, time, tomorrow, yesterday. Uh, we are talking about uh, objects, things, um, and this is all immersed in a magma of a grammar, to use a word, grammar, which is singular, plural, masculine, feminine. In practically each language will do it in a different way, but we will do it, I'm oh, sorry. Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, most research in the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century, has focused on the similarity of languages. Um, before Chomsky, there was more interest uh, in describing the differences, but under his influence, uh, many people have started to assume that these differences don't matter. And it's true what you say, that um, we're, all, we're all human and we tend to talk about very similar things. Uh, but I think that's what makes it so interesting, because even though um, on some abstract level uh, there are indeed similarities, people in different uh, communities, in different cultures, have come up with different solutions to these same problems. So everywhere we have to talk about uh, what someone did. Everywhere we have to find ways to uh, get food and to communicate this information to to the next generation, uh, and, but the precise ways, unlike uh, most other animals that, uh, may, they, that have complicated communication systems, but they are very fixed and rigid. Language allows us to develop really any kind of system, any kind of culture. It's incredibly flexible, but it seems that different languages have chosen to specialize in somewhat different things. This does not, of course, make one language better than another in any way. Um, but in looking at the differences and in looking how uh, they relate to the environments, I think we can learn really about how different cultures have uh, converged on, s on, on solutions to common problems, but in somewhat different ways. And so we can, I think, learn about the hu human capacities. if. Um, people didn't go into these communities and study these languages, um, many might assume that it was, you know, as an English speaker, impossible to do these kinds of navigation tasks. Only if you were some real expert, you know, a sailor, navigator, uh, people would have no idea that in these cultures little kids can, can do this quite well. And so we can, I think, by thinking of language as a kind of technology that trains us in a particular way, 
we can learn more about um, our capacities and also limitations. Bueno, no sé, igual es, se está comprobando si, por ejemplo, esas lenguas que no tienen Dexis, eh, que son tan concretas, eh, que parece que si, no, si los nombres pululan al infinito, o sea, tienen un pensamiento más concreto. Quizá el que una lengua se hable por mucha gente y se, se simplifique su gramática puede permitir organizaciones más complejas y un pensamiento más abstracto. Um, I think it's possible, uh, but it's a difficult question to answer because, of course, people who speak particular languages are also embedded in a given environment. And so languages, for instance, that have no or very few number words, we can ask what effect does it have on uh, the ability of the speakers to do mathematics? And it seems to have uh, a detrimental effect. But that's not a problem for those individuals because in their community they, they don't need to do much formal mathematics. Uh, if that community were to develop a need to do mathematics over time, the language would change. Uh, but in r the, the answer to your question is yes, perhaps, but one really has to do careful studies to, to really get at the specifics. Um, many people, the, the history of looking at language changes, unfortunately, has, hasn't, has been fairly ugly in that, uh, for instance, during colonization of the New World, um, People saw these, um, heard these uh, indigenous Native American languages and uh, made judgments about the cognitive capacities of people who spoke those languages. Uh, and actually, they realized that these languages seem to be more complex, uh, but they, uh, and, and people have written on this, that you know, they perhaps are not abstract enough. They, one cannot do philosophy in these languages or something like this. Uh, And that's not necessarily true, uh, but if languages train our, our brain, train our cognitive systems, there may be costs and benefits to learning a particular system. Um, and, and we're only starting to understand uh, how these are related to each other. So just at the beginning, really. Gracias. Thank you for the thank you thank you for the interesting oh. talk and I was the whole time I was thinking about um, how you would define language and of course we know that it's a really difficult question and one point that you said that um, in the middle of your talk is that a language should be learnable to, uh, learnable to a, to a child and um, in the case of Silbo uh, In the case of Silbo Gomero, <laughs> I mean, I'm not familiar with this whistling uh, language, but I wondered, is it really considered language? Would children, infants, actually be able to segment those whistles into oh, right. reasonable chunks? Um, and how limited is that language, if you call it language, to just certain messages that are very important for conveying, like, come home, or, you know, dinner is done, or whatever? Right. Absolutely. So... The, the whistling kind of language is, uh, uh, as far as I know, there's no one who, there's no child who only speaks that. So it's actually um, more like a, a very limited dialect uh, of, of Spanish, used for a very specific purpose. Um, but uh, it seems that any system that has to take the role of a full language, uh, almost by definition, has to be learnable by infants. So whether it's sign language or actually written language as well, because written languages are also constrained by uh, those, those very same 
factors. Now, of course, written languages are not learned spontaneously. Uh, they have to be taught. Uh, and so that, but that raises the interesting question of uh, how actually people have assumed that all languages are learned by kids uh, equally quickly. But um, we don't know this to be the case. And it may be that, we so we know that uh, the amount of speech directed at children in different cultures varies very dramatically. In some cultures, uh, parents and adults speak to children all the time. In other cultures, um, that's, it's not really done. Kids talk to other kids, and kids, of course, hear adults speak, but adults very rarely uh, speak to the children directly. And so one hypothesis we'd like to investigate, uh, it's an interesting idea, it's just speculation, is that uh, the reason that kids in these cultures, where their kids are not really spoken to very much, the reason they can learn the language, nevertheless, may have something to do with the grammar of the language. And if it was English they were trying to learn, for example, they would not do very well. So there is now a lot of work in the U.S. looking at differences in how much parents speak to the children within the U.S. And even relatively small decreases in child-directed speech have quite serious effects on, for instance, how the child does in school uh, and how much language they, they, they uh, how, how um, um, fluent they are, for instance, at four or five. Um, and uh, so, so it may be that English is very sensitive to this, but other languages that have more grounded and more specific grammatical devices uh, may, may buffer uh, the language from these kinds of effects. It's, it's really speculation, but it's an interesting hypothesis to explore. May I follow up on that question? I mean, the reason why I asked is that I always believe and still believe that at least one universal, I mean, I don't believe there are many, but at least one for spoken languages is that all spoken languages have vowels and consonants. So I wonder whether this whistling system would be really considered as a language, especially if it's, it's not learnable. And, yeah. and the other thing is that um, um, that even sign languages um, have a structure that could be um, basically put in syllables or in structure that is similar to vowels and consonants. Um, so you know that's that's one at least one kind of almost almost a universal that I believe yeah. is is pointing to similarities between the languages, as the, the first question uh. was. was no, that and, and that may well be the case. Um, one interesting relationship that uh, some people are now starting to look at, uh, uh, Dan Dedu at the Max Planck Institute um, just got a grant to s look at whether differences, there are differences between groups in throat morphology. And these differences may make certain consonants easier to pronounce by some people. And the question is whether languages that use these consonants tend to uh, be spoken by people who have throats that make it easier to produce those sounds. And so I'm not sure whether it's the case that someone who doesn't have that kind of throat can't learn the language, uh, but all it takes is a very slight difference to show to, for, for there to be these effects. And so that's another way of um, and, and there it's not saying that some sounds are better than others, again, but uh, that the reason languages sound differently may have something to do with actually physiological differences between populations. Um, and I think it's useful to know this, to understand why languages differ in the ways that they do. But of course, um, we, we in the, some way, we're all, we really have similar bodies, we have similar vocal uh, apparatus, uh, and. Uh, um, consonants and vowels, in a way, are you know, maybe the just the most effective way. You know, there may be other ways, but using these sorts of speech sounds uh, may just be the most effective way for spoken languages to exist. So, yes. Sí. A ver, yo quería preguntar si todos los idiomas, los niños los aprenden a la misma edad, o sea, dominan el lenguaje, independientemente de lo gramáticamente complicados que son. Es decir, con cuatro años o con cinco años, la media de los niños hablan bien castellano. ¿Siempre es a la misma edad? 
o depende del lenguaje? It seems that in a, in a, in a general way, when people have looked at it, the answer is yes, although certain aspects of uh, the grammar may not be learned until, until later. So in some languages, it's quite common for 10-year-olds um, to make certain kinds of mistakes, and it's, it's normal, you know. Um, but uh, what's really unknown, because no one has ever looked at it, is whether getting a five-year-old to that level takes more work, takes more input in some languages than others. We know that there are differences in how much language kids get, how much they're spoken to, but we don't know if it's related to the grammar. So it may be that there's no amount of input that will get a six-month-old talking, right? Uh, so there is a limit, and um, even with very little input, uh, a six-year-old or a seven-year-old will speak quite well. But when you get to a three-year-old, well, then if the three-year-old is learning one language, they may require more input, more direct input, not just uh, watching TV, uh, than, uh, than an infant or child learning another language. And we just don't know. It's, it's possible, but we don't know. Thank you. Just a very, very fa uh, quick uh, comment on, on your question. There is, um, I don't know whether this is published already, but it was a couple of years ago I saw a Danish uh, researcher trying to answer exactly this question where uh, she looked at uh, how children acquire language um, and how quickly over time they get at you know, producing just simple phrases. And um, it seemed to be dependent on the phonological structure of a language. So it turns out that the Danish children were very late compared to all the other children because they have so many vowels in, in their speech input which is very hard for the children to segment, so to find the words. And so they were a little bit delayed <laughs> as compared to the other kids that they had. But I don't know whether it's published and maybe there is more about but there was some difference there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now, le voy a hablar en español. Eh, ¿Cómo explica usted el milagro de que una frase sencilla como no te la daré mañana, tú me has pedido un, algo y yo te digo no te la daré mañana, esta frase, I won't give it to you tomorrow, it has got 2,500 varieties, only one is correct, and children at the age of four or five can pronounce, utter, they know these sentences and can use them perfectly. I won't give it to you tomorrow, in contrast with she didn't give it to me yesterday, or I am not going to give them to him, or whatever. And, and so, uh, I'm sorry, the question is why? Yeah, how is it possible? And how don't we wonder all the time at the miracle of being able to use, a, a to, 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 s to sort out a problem like that, where we've got to make a choice out of 2,500, yeah. and only one is possible, to produce a very short sentence like, uh, did you give it to him? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, one, one answer, so this gets complicated, one answer is that um, all th those possible combinations are not all equally um, heard by the child. Um, they're not all equally likely statistically. And uh, it's, of course, not the case that children just mimic uh, what they hear. Uh, but it is the case that children's initial uses of utterances don't mean what the adult would mean by them. So when a child, uh, when a two-year-old says, uh, can you wait five minutes? Uh, they, they might not know what five, you know, they might not be able to give you five pencils, 
Uh, they know that five refers to something about number, and they know that minutes refers to something about time, maybe. But they also use it quite instrumentally. They mean, if you say five minutes, your mom leaves you alone for a little bit. And of course, uh, it, it, it is amazing how, how, how quickly kids master language. Um, but uh, one also has to keep in mind that uh, languages have the structure that they do because if they didn't, kids wouldn't master them and those languages wouldn't exist. So they're con uh, if something was very, very confusing, kids would learn something and that over time would become the way the language works. Uh, and also, we don't, uh, there are many, many confusing things in language. We don't always understand each other. Uh, languages are not perfect, they're not unambiguous, and uh, that's mostly okay. Many times we don't even realize that we misunderstood someone, but in the worst case, you can ask them to clarify. You can say, can you, s you, know, can you repeat that? Um, and this happens quite a bit, and I think that's in part what makes um, language so fluent and, and usable. Thank you.